Chapter 15 of Luke has three great parables in it, the two that we just heard this morning, and it's followed up by uh, the parable of the prodigal son or the forgiving father. Great chapter. I find a lot of encouragement in it because it deals with the lost being found, and I'm not talking about my relationship with Jesus. I'm talking about the relationship I have with my wallet and my keys. I, uh, in my college years, I was diagnosed and much of my problem with losing things was explained because I discovered I have attention deficit disorder and uh, that is a wonderful cushion to fall back on. I can't help myself. But I, I will tell you this, on Terry's and my first date in 1968, after we graduated from high school, we knew each other in high school and we started to date that summer, uh, we went swimming in a place outside of Austin that has a, a spring thread limestone pool. It was great fun, and I went into the water, had a wonderful day, and my keys went in the pocket of the bathing suit I was wearing, and they fell out 200 feet deep into the mouth of that spring. And it was, it was an embarrassing afternoon. We had to call my parents. There were no cell phones in those days. We had to walk to a place where a phone could be made. They had to drive out. And after all of that, Terry married me anyway. <laughs> she knew. I mean, she had a very clear picture from the start. But in today's, in today's gospel, we've got lost coins and lost sheep. But I want to focus to at least get started on those two uh, stories and about the, the finding of the lost with what happens in the very first line and who is there listening to Jesus and who is there truly hearing him and who isn't. Because if you were reading in your own Bible and going through reading all of Luke, you'd get to the end of chapter 14, and this was chapter 15, verse 1 today, you'd get to the very final verse of 14 and you would hear Jesus say something that he says several other times in the gospel and that occurs in other parts of scripture too. And it's a phrase or a sentence or an imperative command that goes, if you have ears to hear, hear. And that's a big deal. And it means something for us more than just the way we use the word hear in English. I mean, it's kind of casual. Did you hear what I heard yesterday about the latest political thing in Austin? Or did you hear anything on the radio yesterday that you liked? I couldn't hear a single thing. It's just that casual of things bouncing off of our ears, mostly, is what we think of with hearing. But hearing in Scripture has to do with not only hearing, but obeying. Uh, remember the great words in the Old Testament, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Uh, the force of that word is not only hear me, but do something about it, appropriate it, put it in your heart, act on it. And so it is when Jesus repeats that phrase two or three times at least, maybe even more in the Gospels. If you have ears to hear, hear what I am saying to you. And if you remember the opening of the uh, book of Revelation, there is a, a kind of similar phrase. If uh, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches is what John writes there for us as well. So this imperative sound, the imperative nature of hearing is important. And then chapter 15 begins and Luke says, guess who was coming to hear Jesus? It's all the tax collectors, and all the sinners. Well, sinners are, it's a broad category. It, it, it's every one of us in this room. Uh, there's nobody left out, of course. But those Pharisees that are standing there, they're also, at least the words, are striking their ears, but I don't think they're hearing at all in the sense that the scripture calls us to be people who can be not only hearers of the word of Jesus, but doers as well, those who are obedient to the word once it is in you. So those Pharisees, instead of hearing, uh, they continue to talk. If they maybe stopped talking, they would have heard. But uh, like so many of us uh, in our prayer where, where the scripture says, 
uh, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. More often than not, my prayer is, listen, Lord, your servant is speaking. <laughs> and these Pharisees are in that same boat today. They're, they're muttering and offended beyond belief that Jesus would keep company with people who are absolutely unworthy of anything except obliteration by God. In the parables that Jesus says uh, and teaches, he says there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. The idea of the Pharisees was there is rejoicing in heaven when a sinner is obliterated. They have no sense of worth for people who were not perfectionists in the keeping of the law as they self-styled themselves to be. I think that there is a tremendous problem of self-satisfaction that can creep into every Christian life. And that's what, that's what we see here so often. And even in modern church life, you may find uh, in your own thinking, what's that person doing here? Who let them in? And if you do, you're in the category of hearing but not really hearing what Jesus says about all of us because this great flock of sheep that is his is made up of those who are redeemed and those who are not redeemed. It's made up of those who are in every case, though, loved by Jesus Christ, loved by the Father who made them, by the Father who made all of us. And so Jesus teaches about going out after one who is lost and reclaiming one that genuinely matters and how the rejoicing is greater than those over the righteous who need no repentance. I suspect Jesus was laughing on the inside as he looked at the allegedly righteous, the actually self-righteous Pharisees and says, the righteous who need no repentance and he chuckles and says, if only they were actually hearing me. If only they were actually hearing me. Because he knows they need repentance. If nothing else, for the attitude they have about those whom Jesus loves, just as he loves them. Jesus loves his enemies. He loves the righteous. When he can find them, there aren't many. But when he finds them, he loves them. And he goes out to find and pick up the lost. So you and I have been picked up. Uh, we have come in faith this morning and are celebrating as part of this redeemed community. We're rejoicing with Jesus over the redemption of at least one sinner. Ideally, each one of us is the object of that rejoicing today in his heart because we come clean and ready. But the difficulty of Christian life is never reaching the point where you are a sheep who doesn't need that shepherd anymore. You can't self-navigate, you can't self-guide, but there is never a time when you don't need him. And then beyond that, in serious discipleship, there is not just relying on Jesus to pick you up when you fall, but there is that matter of obedience. I think every one of us probably is able to say, the words of the Great Commission, go and make disciples. It's right over here in the, in the caper's window. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then we often don't remember the last part, which is even more difficult than baptizing. It's teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you and commanded you. And that's where, that's where sheepdom kind of goes bad because we, uh, we might be able to recognize ourselves as lost sheep in need of the Lord. We love having him as our savior, but I'm not so sure we are so ready to take the obedience that comes with lordship. Just something for you to think about as we celebrate here today. But the main thing is to give thanks that God actually extends his love to every person in his created order. Today on 9-11, we have a lot to remember of people who did terrible things and yet were those who were loved by the Lord. Hard to imagine, but that's how deep his love is. He doesn't hate anything that he has made. He does not have much patience with sin, but he does not hate anything or anyone that he has made. 
So as we can give thanks today and come to this Eucharist and come to this Holy Communion in just a few minutes, remember that as we come forward and we're singing and we're praising and joining the whole company of heaven, that rejoicing that is going on is rejoicing over us and over all of the others who come as penitent, redeemed people into the presence of the Supreme Shepherd, the Supreme Lord, whose love knows no bounds. Amen. <laughs>